So it sounds, it looks like we have some people coming into the room. So I just want to welcome everyone. We're just, it's going to take a few moments. Uh, we have a lot of people that are, that are waiting to come in. And so it'll just take a minute for us to get started. But uh, I'm very excited for this evening and I hope you are as well. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a very special evening. We have four candidates from British Columbia, from the Central Okanagan and the Kootenays joining us today, as well as NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. So I know a lot of you are very, very excited to hear from our candidates and from our NDP leader. And I just wanna thank everyone so much for joining us. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that we get to have this opportunity directly to hear from, from you um, about what questions you have um, for, for our candidates and for our leader. And so I just wanna uh, start off by just acknowledging that um, a lot of people I'm sure that are joining us today have been impacted greatly by the wildfires um, this summer, but also now we know that they've been impacting our communities. And I just, I know that it's been a, a really hard time for people and I just want to acknowledge that uh, before we get started. Um, and so the first person I would like to introduce today is Grand Chief Philip. If you could please start us off. Hi, Grand Chief. I'm not sure. Uh, it appears to me that you might be. Thank you. My peace next seal as squeeze a seal. Greetings to my greetings to. Hello. Hello. We can hear you now. My apologies. Okay. Uh, okay. Why peace next seal? Greetings and relatives, greetings to my uh, privilege and a pleasure to see territory here in the Okanagan. Um, without question, we have one of the most critical fit, the very future of our grandchildren hangs in the balance of the outcome of this election. I'm so inspired and happy that so many uh, decent candidates have allowed their names to stand. Candidates who know and understand the, the importance of the crisis, the climate crisis, the uh, pandemic, epidemic, the um, everything that afflicts our, our country, racism, um, the, um, you know, the absolute unraveling of the social fabric across this country. And we know in our hearts that the liberals and the conservatives do not have the answers. They don't even understand the questions. And their only concern is to continue to exploit the land and the resources for profit for corporations that are not even resident in this country. So uh, Joan and I have been blessed with 15 of the most beautiful grandchildren in the universe. And everything we do is um, in an effort to make a better future for them and their children. And we know that you are all committed to the same. And we know that um, the status quo is killing our people. The policies of the liberals and the conservatives are greatly bringing great harm to this great nation. And we know, we absolutely know that Jagmeet Singh has the right set of values. He has a good heart and he's, um, he speaks to the truth 
and that is resonating with the people across this country is a very sincere, sincere, serious and caring individual. And that's the type of leadership we need in Ottawa. But he also needs a very strong support team. And I'm praying that uh, Joan uh, makes it into the house because I think her voice will help make the difference that we all strive for in this, this election. So with that, I wish you all well. Um, uh, a little PS here, um, I strongly support Nikki Ashton in, in Northern uh, Manitoba. And I thought that was uh, very classless uh, what the chief said in the presence of our beloved leader, Jagmeet Singh, the other day. Uh, it really deeply angered me. Um, but onward and upward, uh, we have a, um, a very important campaign in front of us. And again, uh, blessings to you all. Uh, may the creator clear your path and strengthen your voice as you carry our important message forward to the general public. Why, Lim Lim? Wow, thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Grand Chief Philip. Those were very poignant remarks and it's always, um, I just, I really appreciated the, the blessing that you put on this evening. And that is, I believe, the reason why all of us are here is, is because we want to change the future. So I really appreciated um, you just setting the stage um, for that this evening. Um, before we get to all of the candidates and the leader tonight, I just wanted to do a little shout out to Cade Descharlais. He is the candidate for Kelowna Lake Country, and he is also joining us tonight as a member of the audience. Um, I believe he's one of the youngest members running, and so it's absolutely fantastic to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Cade. Um, now, next up, I would like to introduce you to Richard Cannings. He has been an MP for two terms, and he would like to be your MP again for his third term. And Richard Cannings is looking to represent, again, the riding of the South Okanagan West Kootenays. Welcome, Richard. Well, thank you, Brittany, and uh, yes, it's wonderful to come to you again from the, the beautiful riding of South Okanagan and West Kootenai. I know Wayne and I always had uh, remarks about which of us had the, the most beautiful riding in the country, but I, you know, I like to think it is here, and I'm speaking to you right now from Fife, the beautiful downtown Fife, uh, a little community above Christina Lake, right in the center of that uh, beautiful riding. Uh, this is the I'm, I'm in the home of uh, the ancestral home of my, my wife's mother's family, the Mazakis, and it's my home away from home in boundary country when I'm on the road and we're on a bit of a road trip to get over to the Kootenays uh, to talk to people there. It's, the campaign has been going very well, very friendly reception everywhere. And I'd, I'd like to just uh, thank uh, Grand Chief Stuart to Philip for his remarks of, about, <clears throat> especially about the anxiety people feel right now and across the southern interior about the fires, the intense heat we've had this summer. I got into politics to be that, uh, to be a voice of uh, science, of reason when it comes to climate change. I wasn't seeing that in the Harper years, of course, and, and it is so important that we carry that voice of, of science and action we need bold action on climate change in ottawa right now i know Stuart and joan live just above me on the west side of penticton and we've been looking at a fire uh, on the mountain above our homes for the past few days i've had my all my valuables packed away in the car ready to go and so many people in this area have felt you know that anxiety that fear all through the summer and we really have to have people in ottawa who can uh, speak the truth about the situation we're in and I'm so glad to be part of the NDP team with Jagmeet and all these other wonderful candidates so that we can do that very very important work in Ottawa so it's great to be here and I'm really happy to be part of Jagmeet's team so thank you 
Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that, you know, after this summer, it's, it's so clear that we need really strong action on climate change. And it's great to know that the NDP is really has been and is ready to continue to step up for us. Next, I would like to introduce Joan Phillip. And Joan is looking to represent the Central Okanagan Similkami Nicola. Thank you so much for joining us today, Joan. Um, I'm One of the reasons I ran, of course, was because of, um, I know that the New Democratic Party is both committed to uh, bold action with respect to the climate uh, change and um, be committed to recommend. Joan, I'm not sure if it's on just on my end, um, but I'm having problems hearing you. I'm wondering if Absolutely. we can... Oh, the Liberals and uh, Kinder Morgan Pipeline uh, assist with uh, Conservatives, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which is, again, not going to help the environment. Farms will not be more detrimental to the environment. With respect to uh, rec... Joan, I'm so sorry. I apologize. We've had I... nine the liberals have done nothing. And the conservative government said she said that she was. Okay, thank you, Joan. I'm really sorry. It, it appears that we're having a problem with the internet connection. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to move on, but the snippets that I was able to hear, I really appreciated um, all of your passion and where you come from. And I really hope that we see you as an MP uh, representing us here in British Columbia, of course, but for on the federal level, we see you in Ottawa. So thanks again so much, Joan. And next, I would like to move to Wayne Stetsky. Wayne has served one term as an MP and he is seeking to serve as an, uh, his second term. And he would, he's gonna be representing hopefully uh, uh, Kootenai Columbia. Thank you so much for joining us today, Wayne. Thank you, Brittany. And it is really an honor to be here um, and to be part of Jugmeet's team. There's a good reason Jugmeet that you were ranked number one in terms of leader trustworthiness by Canadian. So it's an honor to be back with you you know, I've spent my life devoted to serving people and to serving the environment. And I really, really want to return to Ottawa to continue to both serve the constituents here in Kootenai, Columbia, and to work on the many, many issues facing us, of which number one, of course, is climate change. This writing will either go Conservative or it will go NDP. And so I am appealing to progressive voters from every party, whether it's a liberal or a conservative or a green, uh, I'm looking for your vote in this election. It was such an honor to serve you from 2015 to 2019, and I'm very much looking forward to serving you again. Thank you so much, Wayne, and we look forward to having you serve us again. Um, it was, I had, I had fun with Wayne just uh, last week, we were, we were out door knocking and because we weren't able to door knock during my election, it was great to learn the ropes from someone like Wayne who has just so much wisdom and experience. So thanks again, Wayne. And next up, I would like to welcome Bill Sundu. Uh, Bill actually ran in 2015, and this is his time now to become our MP. And um, Bill is running for Kamloops Thompson Caribou. Welcome today, Bill Sundu. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Brittany, and welcome everybody for joining us this evening. It's my honor to welcome you as I sit here uh, on the traditional and unceded territory of Tecumseh to Swetmik, and more widely in Kamloops Thompson in Swetmik Ulu. I'm also very proud to say that Jigmeet Singh is the only federal leader to visit Kamloops and pay his respects at the Kamloops Residential School. 
we had a very powerful and emotional visit at the school. And it was very um, impressive because there was a clear, uh, sincere acknowledgement, uh, a firm acknowledgement of the courage courageous positions our leader Jagmeet Singh has taken throughout his leadership of our party on matters of truth, reconciliation, and justice. And this is a firm part of our commitment as we embark on this historic election. Uh, as the uh, Grand Chief has said, I believe this will be an election in which the decisions we make will be with us for decades. Our economy, our environment, our health care, the sense of uh, what kind of country we're going to be in regard to social justice and also the strength of our democracy. I'd like to uh, say, uh, just like Wayne did, that this is a very tight race here between us and the Conservatives. Uh, we have them on the run. Our message of hope, fairness, affordability, and our shared humanity is resonating. This is going to be a change election, and we're showing voters why every day we're the right choice. I'd like to thank my volunteers. You're the best. And I invite others to join us, and you can do so by visiting my website. Come and join us. It's a lot of fun. And that's at billsundu.ndp.ca. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Bill, for your wisdom. And of course, volunteers, that's what is needed in every campaign. And so if you haven't already signed up, um, with your local, uh, for, to, for your local MP to get them elected, please sign up. And again, of course, everyone's always looking for donations. No one told me to say that. I just wanted to put that in there because as you're campaigning, that's something that uh, is always needed. And next, I am just absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to get to introduce the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh. He is a courageous, inspiring uh, person, and I can't imagine someone better to be our Prime Minister. So it is a tremendous honour for me to be able to introduce Jagmeet Singh for you tonight. Thank you so much, Jagmeet, for joining us. Brittany, thank you so much. Uh, for folks listening at home, can I just get you all to break out your twinkle hands and give Brittany, our host, a big applause? She is amazing. Thank you so much, Brittany. You've been a, a great host and you are an awesome new MLA to the team. And I look forward to working with you and, and spending some time out in your riding. And a big shout out to all of our amazing candidates. You heard from them. These are folks that care deeply about their communities. They bring so much experience and, and wisdom and a desire to fight for you and your families to make life better. So thank you to each and every one of you. I want you to know, I want you to know I'm coming to you today from I mean, Montreal is sort of the traditional territories of the Canestage, the Mohawk people. And as we acknowledge the traditional territories, it's also important for us to remember the injustice that the first people of this land have faced and also our commitment to fight for justice, to, to fight for that true reconciliation with action, not just with words. Um, and I want to I wanna open up. I know that we're going to have some questions. I'm looking forward to those questions. I just want you to know that in this pandemic, when things were really tough, New Democrats were there for you. We fought to get you more help, fought to keep small businesses open, and we fought to help people who were feeling the struggles of this pandemic. We were there for you to get more help to more people. And we know that in the recovery, people are gonna need New Democrats to fight for them. So we wanna encourage everybody, wherever you are, when you vote for New Democrat, you get someone who's fighting for you, someone who's gonna lift you up, someone who's gonna make you the priority. And we've seen that Justin Trudeau hasn't done that. He hasn't made people a priority. And a lot of the struggles that we're faced with have only gotten worse over this time. A lot of folks in the interior have been really struggling with the ravages of the climate crisis, particularly with forest fires. And, and folks have mentioned uh, the fear and the worry. You know, speaking to people in the interior, I know how scary it is to have these forest fires that are ravaging communities. An entire community of Lytton was wiped out. I remember meet, meeting kids who, who were worried that this was going to be the normal, that they're just going to every summer fluctuate between smoke-filled air or the winter and there's not going to be uh, a day where they could breathe freely. These are real worries that people have. And I know that things haven't gotten better. With six years of Justin Trudeau being the Prime Minister, we've missed every single target. Emissions have gone up. He has the worst record of all G7 leaders and we can change this. We have so many opportunities. We can, with the technology that we have, with the resources that we have, we can invest in renewable energy. We can invest in retrofitting buildings and homes to reduce emissions. We can invest in clean transportation, 
electrifying public transport. We can do so much. There are so many opportunities. I'm really excited about those opportunities. It's a scary time and people are worried, but we can keep hope in our hearts. If we make the right decisions, we can fight this climate crisis and we can turn back the tide, but it's gonna take real leadership and real commitment and courage. And that's what you get when you get new Democrats. Um, I also wanna take a moment to reflect on uh, Bill Sandu mentioned Kamloops uh, visiting where the first 215 children were found in unmarked graves really hit home for me, but I think it's sh it shook a lot of Canadians. The Indigenous communities knew about this for a long time, and a lot of people knew that residential institutions were horrible, but the discovery of these children really drove home how horrible. And what happened when people started holding memorials across the country, it was a moment where Canadians started to demand real action. And I think there's a powerful desire out there for us to do more and to walk the true path of reconciliation. And so that's something you can count on for New Democrats. We are going to make sure that we bring every child home, that we ensure that every community has clean drinking water. There is no excuse in a country as wealthy as ours that every single community doesn't have clean drinking water. We're going to make sure we implement all of the truth and reconciliation's calls to action. And we are truly going to make sure that the first people of this land have respect, dignity, and justice. So thank you so much again for being here. Thank you to the candidates, thank you to Brittany, and thank you to all of you who are attending. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions, and I'm gonna pass the mic back over to Brittany, and I look forward to hearing from you all, your questions, your thoughts, and as was mentioned, if you believe in what we're doing, please don't hesitate to sign up to volunteer, to donate, to get involved. Thank you so much, you're all amazing. Back to you, Brittany. Thank you, Jagneet. You're always inspiring. And uh, we, we were so fortunate to be able to have you join us today. So I just wanted to say how appreciative um, I am. And I know I'm, I'm sure I speak on everyone's behalf when we just say thank you. Um, and so I just, before we go into the Q&A portion, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows how to be able to participate. So there is a chat function on Zoom and you're gonna be able to type your question and you're gonna direct message your question to Q&A and then they're gonna receive the questions. We're gonna to try to hit as many questions as we can. Uh, we wanna to try to get a diversity of questions. So we're talking about all different topics, um, but please, if you have a question, submit it in the chat and we are going to do our best to get to as many questions as possible. And I just want to remind everyone that this is a space that we want to be respectful and kind. And so we'll get started. We have our first question. So Sandra is going to be joining us. And Sandra, um, you have a question about affordable housing and mental health. And I just wanna say thank you so much, Sandra, for also having your camera on and your orange shirt. It's lovely to see. Um, thank you for joining us. And Sandra, what is your question? Oh, can, sorry, Sandra, you're still muted. I'm just gonna see if the host can unmute Sandra, please. Oh, oh Sandra, I'll let you know. Oh, oh you got it, Sandra. I got, I got it, good. Well, thank you very much for having me. And my question tonight is, uh, across Canada, there is a lack of affordable appropriate and safe housing for too many people and families and if you're living with a brain illness like schizophrenia this is just one of many barriers and obstacles um, you might be facing and i just would like you to comment on what how you feel about this complex issue and thank you very much thanks so much sandra thanks for the question i see you there with a wonderful shirt on and thanks for waving waving right back at you um and the housing um I want to call it a crisis. I just don't want to under or overuse the word, but it truly is a crisis. When we look at what's going on around Canada, uh, you're not alone. I, I hear from people everywhere that they cannot find a place to live, and it's it's uh, an issue that's impacting people from all walks of life. People are facing barriers because they can't find something that's in their budget. They look and they look, and some people are are worried because they're losing their current housing and they can't find another another place to go. Uh, people are being rent evicted. It, it, it is really a big problem. And what we've seen over the past number of years, it's only gotten worse. Yeah. It's only gotten worse. It's only harder and harder every year. And, and sadly, since uh, Justin Trudeau became prime minister in 2015, the just one example of how bad it's gotten, the national average price for a home has gone up 
by three hundred thousand dollars. So things are definitely getting more unaffordable. And I know some people can't even imagine ever owning a place. They're just looking to find a place that's in their budget to rent, and they can't find that either. So I want you to know we are going to tackle this. This is such an important problem for me that I want to I want to solve it. I want to fix it. I know that there are pressures that are driving up the cost of housing, so we want to tackle those. And we also want to build and invest in half a million new affordable homes. And this is the wide, a wide range of housing, from assisted living to supported living to uh, cooperatives and not-for-profit housing. We really want to build homes that are within people's budgets, that give them a place, that they feel safe and secure. We know we can do this. It's just going to take making this a priority, putting a lot of resources behind it, We've got a plan to do it, and we're committed to making it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jagmeet, and thank you, Sandra, for the question that I'm sure so many of us are thinking the exact same thing tonight. Um, before we move to the next question, it will be Reese, but I just want to remind everyone that if they would like to, um, just submit a, uh, a question in the chat below to Q&A, and we're going to try to hit as many questions as possible. All right, Reese, you are up next, and you have a question about negativity and racism in the campaign. Thank you for that, Reese. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Hey, Reese. Yeah, I Reece. can. Hi. Hey, good uh, to see yeah. you. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, yeah, we're almost halfway through this election campaign. We've seen a rise in negativity and racism, especially here in our candidate, Bill Sundu. <laughs> um, there's this huge anti-vax rally that was going on at our hospital today, and the rise of hate and fear is really concerning. How do we, as a society, counter this? Reese, I really appreciate the question, and, and I am also worried, like you, I've seen some of these rallies. Let's, let's put a couple things on the side. If people want to protest and raise their concerns, they should be able to, and we support that. And we support people having different opinions. That's absolutely allowed and, and in fact, it should be encouraged. But what we're seeing, like you mentioned, Reese, is that it's not just people having a different opinion, but uh, we're seeing a lot of racism in, in these, some of these rallies or some of these people coming together. They're putting out misogynistic messages, violent messages, and that's just not, that's just not welcome. Not that it's, not only is it not welcome, it's wrong and it should not be happening. Uh, people can be very passionate. They can raise their concerns. But violence and racism and misogyny have no place, no place in our society. And so we've got to be really clear on, on that. Um, and so what I, what I think, a couple of things we need to do. One, we know that one of the root causes of a lot of hatred that we're seeing when people are being radicalized with hatred, a lot of that's coming from online hate. And a lot of that is misinformation that's spread and it's used to radicalize people. And we've seen it in some of the worst massacres that have been that have been uh, caused by or have been motivated by hate, we've learned that the folks that were, that were the attackers or the perpetrators were radicalized by online hate. So that's one thing we gotta tackle. We've gotta use every resource we can to get at online hate, to make sure that, those misinform that mis misinformation is immediately removed and not allowed to spread. We also know that there's hate groups out there that are, that are acting purposely with that goal of dividing people and spreading information that, that's designed to inspire and to create hate. And so a lot of these groups are, are extreme right-wing groups, are white supremacist groups, and we've been calling on the dismantling of these type of groups. And we started by pushing to have the Proud Boys banned, and groups like that need to be dismantled and not have a space to take hold. And, and finally, I think we need to really look at uh, anytime there's a hate crime, it should be prosecuted as a hate crime. Uh, there is a particular denunciation, like we want to denounce, particularly when a crime is, is committed because of hate. Uh, and I know Bill is an awesome candidate and he's super resilient. He's shown his story is a story of resilience and he'll be all right, but it shouldn't be that people have to be so resilient and thick skinned to be able to put themselves out. We want to encourage everyone to participate. We want women to participate. We know that the misogyny and the, and the, and the already existing violence against women are just additional barriers that will dis discourage women from coming forward. So I think it's all of our responsibilities to make sure there's a safe space for women, for, for racialized people, for vulnerable people to get involved, to be able to put their name out. People should feel safe. And uh, we've got a, a lot of work to do to make sure that happens. But I really appreciate the question, Reese, and you can count on us to make sure we do everything we can to fight it. Thank you so much, Reese, for your question, and Jagmeet, of course, for your uh, very compelling answer. And next up, we have Melissa. 
And Melissa has a question on about COVID-19 and the disproportionate effects on different groups of people. Welcome, Melissa, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, and hello, Jagmeet and everyone. It is great to be with you. My name is Melissa Garcia and I work with Care Canada, an international organization working in development and humanitarian response globally with offices located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, known as Ottawa. Um, as Brittany mentioned, of course, COVID has affected everyone, but not equally so, and very disproportionate impacts on women and girls, especially from marginalized and racialized communities, which threatens progress in the global recovery, which is so critical for Canada. Um, impacts are in health, with women being over 70% of the health workforce in Canada and globally, on safety, with women and girls facing increased levels of violence, uh, misogyny, as you just mentioned, um, of levels of hunger, and livelihoods with unpaid um, care work and loss of work. And yet women are underrepresented in leadership, often unpaid, and their organizations on the front lines are underfunded, including for the climate crisis globally. Um, and this makes the importance of women's leadership so critical for a just and equitable recovery. So my question for you is, given that a recovery will depend on women leading in their communities in Canada and around the world, what will you do to invest in women's leadership for the recovery? Well, wow, that's, uh, first of all, an incredibly compelling question. And you've really laid out the case. So just, I want to acknowledge that in, in you know, a short question you've laid out really the the challenge that we're up against that COVID-19 you know in a lot of ways we we talk about how it impacted all of us but it has impacted people differently and women have been amongst the hardest hit by the by the pandemic and you're absolutely right to acknowledge that and and it's a part of when I think about a recovery I have to think about a recovery in terms of who's been hardest hit and who needs the most support in in getting and getting out of this pandemic and moving into recovery. And so we've got to keep that lens. Who's been hardest hit? We know racialized people, marginalized people, and women have been hardest hit. So they have to be very central in our plan around the recovery. So that just that lens, I think, is really important. And then specifically for women leadership, um, one of the most important tools we know to, to bring equity back and to bring support for women, one specific program is, of course, uh, child care early childhood education is, is an incredibly important tool to address the disproportionate impact on women, particularly in the workplace, and being able to have the time to be involved in leadership. The more we invest in childcare, the more it'll, it'll support women. I think that's key. I also think that we've got to create actively and proactively create space for women. If women have been excluded and pushed out proactively from spaces of power, we also have to then respond to that, not just by saying, okay, we should encourage women and just kind of be a little bit less a fair or sit back and just say, okay, women should get involved. I think it requires really being proactive. So one of the things we've done as a, I've done as a leader is make sure that we are very actively recruiting women to be candidates, to be leaders. Uh, we've got a policy around making sure incumbent ridings are ridings where one before have to be filled with candidates that come from diverse backgrounds or equity seeking backgrounds. So that's just a policy that I think specifically helps us achieve that. Uh, there's a lot that we need to do. And so you've, You've touched on a broad topic. Those are just some of the commitments amongst many others that we have to do to address this the way you've, you've laid out. We've got to respond to the people who've been the most impacted with the recovery that responds to those folks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was a very well thought out question and a very well thought out answer. I really, uh, an answer also that came from the heart. So I really, really appreciated that. Next up, we have Jason and Jason has a question regarding reconciliation. Welcome Jason, the floor is yours. You're gonna need to unmute yourself. Perfect, there you go. Hello, um, Jagmeet. I wanted to first of all say that uh, I'm I'm I'm, an, I'm I'm one of those sad people who missed your visit uh, to Kamloops. Oh, I teach, that's okay. <laughs> I teach at the local university. <clears throat> Many years ago, I actually had a deep relationship with the uh, Indian resident um, offices because uh, they would buy a lot of office equipment from me when I was in sales. 
And I remember the feeling when I was in that building. I can't even imagine, because I, I couldn't actually, I couldn't gird myself to actually go and visit the residential school at the time. And the reason I'm saying this is that uh, the university where I teach right now um, has been deeply affected <clears throat> by the news and by the by the revelations uh, of, of dead children. I teach in the Faculty of Arts and there were people who were openly weeping uh, during our meeting. It's a very, very highly emotional topic to get involved in. And I apologize, I am wearing blue, but I actually have an original orange shirt uh, from uh, uh, the red dirt shirts back, back in the States. But anyway, the point that I'm driving at is because I'm involved in, in education, I wanted to hear your thoughts on what it meant for a deeper sense. And I, and I, I want to go a level further than what most leaders have spoken about of reconciliation in conjunction with education. The reason I asked this question is um, I was born in 1964. We can all do the math now. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, the history books that I was raised with still used words like savages. Uh, it still used uh, phrases such as uh, settling and uh, an expanding culture uh, rather than seeing culture for where it was. And the education right now, uh, to me, uh, is still sadly lacking. And I wonder, is there a role? I know that primarily it's a, it's a provincial issue. I understand that. But there are positions that the federal government has uh, that could be taking part of that. And where do, you, where do you see it shaping? I know it's not necessarily part of your platform, but I also know you're a thinking and intellectual man from what I've seen from your presentations. I also know you're a practical man as being a Sikh because I'm one of those weirdos who actually knows what the dagger represents. It actually represents the separation of truth from lies. And I understand that. So I wanted to position that to you. I realize I kind of rambled. It's almost the most anti-academic question you're gonna get, <laughs> but I think, I think you got it. Yes. And to see you smile, I just wanted to thank you so much uh, for the honor of speaking directly to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. Um, I wish we could do this in person, but you know, moments when we can connect, I feel like there is something uh, that can be said about having these Zoom meetings that would bring us that otherwise I'm, I'm here in Montreal and I wouldn't be able to meet you in person, but I'm, I'm glad that we can connect this way. Thanks for the question. And uh, as you were asking the question, I was thinking about you know, what we could do. Uh, I, I can tell you, I just wanted to share this, that, that you mentioned it, would be, it was hard for you to go to the actual site. I, I could say, for some reason it was one, it was, I mean, I know why, but it was really incredibly impo uh, difficult for me when I was standing and speaking with, with some media and I had the residential institution behind me and, and I kept on looking back and I would get choked up just thinking this is where it all happened. In this building behind me, this is where kids were, were stripped of their identity, their language, their sense of self and their lives. And I was just thinking, and there was a survivor who had gone to the residential school and she told me, yeah, I went to that school the girls were on this side, the boys were on that side, and I, it was just so heartbreaking. And I think, you know, Canadians are good people. Like if we let, if folks really knew what happened to Indigenous people, they really felt what Canada had done and continues to do, all Canadians would agree that we've, we've got a responsibility. Like it's not just a question of should we or should we not. We've got a moral responsibility to set things right. We can never take back the, the, the heinous acts that have been perpetrated against Indigenous people. But we can certainly do something about it now. We can stop them from going on any further. And we can certainly do something for justice. And a part of that is for people to know what really happened. There should be no debate about how heinous uh, the residential ins institutions were. And people should know that, the, that this, was, this was colonialism. It wasn't, it wasn't people that came in and explored and discovered. There were communities here, there were civilizations here, there were, there were teachings and, and there were families and there was community and there was language and there was governance and there was technology and there was, 
there was science, there was, there was culture here, to your point. There, there wasn't that culture was expanded here, there, was already, there were already people here. And I believe if we did a better job of teaching folks, you know, people would all appreciate that, that we've got to do something then to set things right. And, and so I think there is a role that we could play at the federal level. Of course, education is still a jurisdiction provincially, but I'm sure there's a, there's a way for us to gather some of the best practices, some of the best ways of, of sharing knowledge and some of the most important things for people to know and kind of build what a national framework around what should we expect that, that we, we learn as, as kids growing up and what, we, we, what should we learn about Canada's you know, great achievements, but also some of the really horrible things that we've been a part of. As a part of us becoming a better nation, I feel like we could grow and be better if we reflected on this. And, and so, yeah, I think there's a role that we can play. And um, just to give you some, some, I don't know, sense of uh, solidarity, I've actually received not the, the same eloquent way you put it, but I've had other people raise questions about what we could do federally to, to create a national framework around, around education and what people should know. And, particularly about the injustice against Indigenous people. So yeah, I think you're not alone. I think people definitely want to do something about this, and, and I think we can. Yeah, and thank you for the shout out about uh, knowing about the Kirpan and some of the Sikh traditions. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Thanks so much, Jason, and thank you, Jagmeet. I just want to remind people, I've seen uh, some people, I I've seen them raise their hands. Um, we just are asking people if they have a question to please use the chat function, send a message directly to Q&A and they will put you in the queue. So thank you so much everyone who has been asking questions so far. Uh, next up we have Graham and Graham has a question regarding the opiate crisis. Good evening. Um, we have so many problems. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that uh, Richard uh, and Jagmeet uh, and others have emphasized things like climate change, things like uh, racism, uh, inequalities of all kind, homelessness. I learned today um, that more people have died of opiate overdoses in British Columbia and are dying of COVID-19. And it's not just a BC problem. It's not just a Vancouver problem. It's a, a national problem. Even in Penticton, where I now live, we have overdose deaths, which are surely preventable. What is the policy of the NDP towards this, I think, often overlooked crisis? And I'm not saying that it's the most the major one. There are so many things that are dramatic and, and major, but this is one that is surely preventable, uh, but I'm not sure what the steps are that we're going to take to prevent particularly young people, uh, from dying of drug overdoses. Mm -hmm. It seems to me very, very serious, and it's compounded, of course, very often with other kinds of things, like poverty and homelessness. There's an issue which I think that uh, has been sidestepped just a little. So if there's some comments that uh, you could make on uh, how to deal with this, this, this terrible crisis is affecting even the little town Penticton where I live. I would be very, very grateful to uh, have a sense of going forward. Thank you so much, Graham. I, re I really appreciate the question. And uh, hi to you. And I see uh, another person on the screen beside you there. Hi to you both. Um, I just want to say uh, you're absolutely right that while we've been dealing with the COVID-19 crisis unfold, the global pandemic, the, it hasn't meant that the other crises have gone away. And we've seen really sobering and, and really disturbing news about the impacts of the opioid crisis, that that crisis has not gone away and in fact has gotten worse. So uh, I, I hear you when, you when you talk about that. It's absolutely true and it's really heartbreaking. And one of the things that we've learned, seeing the, the toll the loss of life, how many people are dying to the opioid crisis. 
one of the things that's emerging really clearly is that the previous approach that we've taken has not worked. It's not working. People are, 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 getting, are, are getting addicted, are, are, are using substances that end up uh, drug overdoses and are losing their lives. And the approach that's been taken for so long has not worked. So we can't continue to do the same thing hoping for a different outcome. We can't take the same approach. And so uh, I, I can speak to you as also as a lawyer. I, I represented clients that were, that were arrested and charged with personal possession when they, when they had uh, possession of a controlled substance. And these are folks you know, that I represented, I met with, and they were, not, they were not best served by the criminal justice system. These are folks that were dealing with mental health or addiction or poverty. They did not need a criminal justice solution. They needed a healthcare solution. And, and so what I'm advocating for is let's take a different approach. Let us stop uh, putting people that need help through the criminal justice system. That is not a solution. Let's instead respond with care and compassion. And as the evidence suggests, there are better ways for us to care for people, to help them out, to save their lives, but also to make our community safer. So let's respond with care and compassion and health care instead of criminal justice to help people that are going through this. And let's be open to the evidence. If there's a good argument and there's evidence-based reasons for a certain approach, let's be open to that approach if it's gonna save lives and keep our community safer. So uh, I, I really hear you on the question and, and I believe we can take a different approach. And that's what we're advocating in our platform. Thanks so much, Graham. And Brittany, before we uh, get to, I, was, I wanted to mention something in an earlier question around, around uh, I feel like I was trying to fit a time to mention it around uh, the climate crisis and I, and I wasn't able to respond uh, with this. So I want folks to know for the people particularly so impacted in the interior, for people, you know, Bill Sandhu, I was there with you in Kamloops and we saw how, how smoky the air was and how people were, were really worried about this. They were distressed and there was this constant fear, will, will the fire spread towards Kamloops or not? For Richard and Penticton and, and seeing the recent images of, of the fire getting really close to the city, getting close to the airport, and, and that's where actually a lot of the helicopter training happens for folks that, that are involved in, in trying to put out the fires. And, and for folks that are, you know, communities that have been destroyed like Lytton and communities that are at, at constant risk of evacuation, I want to propose a solution. We know that a lot of communities could become more resilient to the realities of the climate crisis if there was a fund available to invest in some of the proactive solutions to mitigate some of the disaster. So what we're proposing and what's in our plan, something we want to announce today, is that a new Democrat government would provide a $3 billion disaster mitigation fund. And this fund would allow communities to be able to make investments in proactive solutions so they're not as vulnerable to extreme weather circumstances. This would allow communities that could put in place some protections against potential flooding or forest fires uh, there are there are steps that communities can take that can make them more resilient and less susceptible to extreme weather circumstances and less susceptible th to things like forest fires. And putting in those that putting in those steps, those that proactive uh, infrastructure that would prevent some of the worst from happening, I think makes a lot of sense. And and that's why we're announcing that a new Democrat government would allow for municipalities to access up to three billion dollars or a fund of $3 billion so that communities can access this fund and to be able to, to make investments in their communities to make them more resilient. Um, and that's something I think would help a lot of people. Thank you so much, Jagmeet. Um, I think that that is absolutely critical. And I know that a lot of people will be so grateful to hear it. Um, that, is a, that is a very, very welcome announcement. Thank you for announcing that uh, to, here tonight with us. Um, next up, we have Susan, and Susan has a question regarding old growth. Hello, Susan. Please take it away. And lovely orange shirt. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I would just I want to congratulate you on becoming a parent soon. Oh, thank you. Uh, it speaks volumes about your optimism for the future. I'm sure that you and Gurkaran have concerns about the uncertainty of the world that young people face today. They're looking for leadership that will address their existential crisis. But they want to know where you stand when it comes to the conflict over old growth forests. I understand that you were out at Ferry Creek this past summer and experienced 
the love and respect that people have there for Mother Earth and for the last 10 of productive forests there that they're fighting for. They're putting their lives on the line for us, for all of us, for our children, our grandchildren. Those mother trees have become a symbol of world, symbol worldwide of the, of the colonial unsustainable extractive practices mm -hmm. that have caused so much damage to the planet. They're being violently assaulted by the RCMP and those mercenaries in green suits. I understand that the forestry is a provincial jurisdiction and that there's some etiquette that's expected when it comes to provincial leaders. <clears throat> but the RCMP and indigenous issues are federal concerns. When you're prime minister, what would you do to ensure that indigenous people resume their traditional rights quickly and the sorry, the rights and responsibilities for the land? And how would you address the escalating violence towards peaceful protesters? Thank you so much for the question, Susan. Um, I, I want to start off with, uh, with the last part of your question. We, we've seen a, a really deeply disturbing uh, trend uh, over the past period of time where there have been more and more incidences of, uh, of extreme use of force in, in policing. We've seen that in the States. Uh, we see that here in Canada. And we're seeing uh, really troubling examples of violence and the overuse of aggressive tactics. And instead of de-escalation, uh, escalating uh, uh, tactics that, that increase the tension in conflict. So we've long called for an, a review of the force used, uh, overhaul of the approach when it comes to we, we can govern the, the federal federally regulated policing, so the RCMP, uh, a, a complete overhaul of the use of force, a focus on de-escalation, and, and we absolutely think that the, the violence against the protesters was heavy-handed and absolutely inappropriate. And so we can do better. Uh, we've been calling on Justin Trudeau to, to overhaul the, the approach of the RCMP when it comes to how that should happen, how should interactions be between, uh, between the RCMP and, and, and citizens and people. And there's, there's, there's a way to do that. And we've seen a lot of inaction on the part of Justin Trudeau to bring in those reforms. And I believe we need to. I need to we need to reform policing in, in general to make sure people aren't losing their life or, or being the victim of extreme violence in those circumstances. And I think that there is, there's a lot that we can do to make sure that that's better. Um, when it comes to old growth forests, I, I don't want to uh, have uh, it be said that I was at Fairy Creek when I was actually at Mira's Island. So I, I was uh, with the majesty of, of old growth forest, but it was in a, in a different community. So, so I just wanted to correct that. But, um, I, and I did see the incredible beauty of the, the old growth forest. Uh, that was one of the sites of um, one of the largest uh, civic or civil unrest or civic uh, civil movements to protect the forest in, on Mira's Island. Indigenous communities were a big part of it. And, and to be able to be in the majesty of those trees was a really special opportunity. I care deeply about the environment. I care deeply about protecting, conserving our forests. And indigenous communities are, are the landholders. Uh, they, uh, they are the land defenders. They've got traditions and teachings and, and learnings about how to be stewards. And we need to support indigenous-led conservation. So indigenous communities have to be at the heart of any conservation. We need to do more to protect and conserve our forests. And so that's why we're proposing a $500 million fund to support indigenous-led conservation, to help indigenous communities preserve their land. Uh, I believe we need to have a better post approach to policing, and we need to be better allies to work with indigenous communities so they can conserve their land and conserve their forests. And that's what we're proposing to do. Thank you so much for your question, Susan. And of course, Jagmeet, thanks for your thoughtful answer. Next up, we have Cade. And Cade has a question regarding the relationship between students and government. Welcome, Cade. The floor is yours. Wait a second. Hi. This is Cade, our candidate as well, right? Yes. Yes, yes. that's awesome. <laughs> well, Doug, me, I just first wanted to say that it's, it's actually crazy that I'm talking to you right now. I've, I've looked up <laughs> you for such a long time, and you're one of the reasons why I'm running in this race. And, and I, I'm just looking forward to, to keep going on this fight. Um, but I, I'm coming to you, you know, from Kelowna uh, as a 19 year old, and, and it's not generally the case where a 19 year old is involved in politics at, at such an early start. But, but my goal with the campaign is to try to engage as many young people as possible. And, and I wanted to ask you, how do we ensure that uh, young people are included in the conversation? How do we uh, ensure that 
we have a strong relationship between our government and our student population. That's what I'll pose to you. I appreciate the question. Uh, one of the things that I, I try to do is make sure we have a lot of time. I have a lot of time in my schedule where I'm, or I'm hearing from people directly, hearing their concerns. We make sure a lot of that outreach that we do, the listening is with young people. We want to make sure we know what young people are going through, what their hopes are, what their fears are, and what we can do to make life better. And, and a lot of the, the reason why we were able to, to respond in the pandemic to the needs of young people is because we've been listening. So we saw when young people mentioned that you know, university students who were looking to go back to their communities in the summer and work in the summer couldn't find jobs that they were looking forward to working because they needed it to get back to school and they didn't qualify for CERB, they were kind of left out high and dry. So we fought to actually get those students supports. We got uh, the Canadian Emergency Student Benefit. That was something that we fought for because we listened to students who organized and said, we've been left out of this. We've been ignored, we've been missed out. So we listened to them, we heard them, and then we were able to fight to get some supports and we won that fight. But that's something, that's an ongoing thing. It's not a one-off. We're not just gonna listen once and then stop. And we've heard from a lot of students that they're struggling with the, the weight and burden of, of student debt. And so when we initially started off saying, well, there should be no interest on student debt, we heard from students saying, well, we're also worried about the debt that we graduate with. And so that's why we propose, I think the first time for any federal party to propose waiving or forgiving student debt. We've seen the liberals forgive corporate debt. Uh, we believe that we should be forgiving student debt. So that's, that's a big push. So uh, it's ongoing. Hopefully folks like you uh, that we can speak with uh, Kate and keep in touch with. Uh, we want to make sure young people are always a part of the conversation. And I believe, I'm going to put it out there, I think young people are going to make history in this election. Young people have always been at the forefront of social justice movements. And we've seen them recently in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the climate actions, that young people are active, they care, and are going to make a big difference in the world generally, but specifically in this election. So I'm stoked and pumped about that. And we're going to continue to stay engaged. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doug Mead. Thanks, Kate. Wow. And that was, uh, I think, the perfect question to end off um, those, to end uh, with this evening. So I just want to thank everyone who asked a question, but also acknowledge that there was, I'm sure, many people that had questions that we just were unable to get to tonight. But thank you, everyone, for participating, all of the attendees, um, and of course, all of the candidates. And next, I just want to um, let our leader, Jagmeet, please say a last few words. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brittany. First, again, first of all, thank you so much for being here with us the whole night and for your awesome job as an MC. I think we might be calling you up again to do this because you're great at it and you're awesome. Uh, thanks again to all our amazing candidates. You are all amazing. Keep up the fight. And a big shout out to everyone who attended tonight. You are all amazing. It's great to, to see the names pop up and I saw some questions popping up and it's great to be able to ha answer some of your questions. Uh, thank you. And, and I just want to put it to folks that there's a real choice in this election. You know, we can choose between another four years of Justin Trudeau, who has let people down on the biggest crises that we heard questions about, whether it's housing, whether it's the opioid crisis, or whether it's uh, indigenous justice for indigenous people, or the environment and the climate crisis. Things have gotten worse, not better. And I believe we can make things better. I believe if we make better choices, we will get better results. We can tackle these problems. If we made them a priority, we could fix them. And I'm hopeful about the future. Um, one, of the, one of the questions we got mentioned, I think Susan mentioned, I'm gonna be a father soon. And, and I'm excited about that, but I'm also worried about the future for my, for my little one and, and the future that we're gonna leave behind to all of our young ones. And I think we've got a responsibility to do something big and important to build a legacy where we can be proud of. I want to be able to look all of our kids in the eyes and say, we fought with everything we had to build a, a legacy for you, a future for you. And I think we can do that. So to make that happen, though, you need to get out and vote. So if I can wrap up by saying, please get out and vote. Ask your friends, ask your neighbors, ask your relatives, ask the people around you, make a plan. You can go to our website, howyouvote.ca, make a plan. Get out and vote. Gurkidan just voted today. It was easy. You can do it. Uh, make sure you get out and vote, folks. Make a plan, though. If you're nervous about going voting in person, please check out the website so you can find a way to vote by mail. Uh, there are dates in advance we can go. If you're worried about crowds, you can go early to the returning office. Just vote. For any of these changes, the only way to make it happen is by voting. Thanks so much. Love you all. Take care and good night.
Thank you, everyone. And that is the end of this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, thank you so much, Jagmeet. You continue to inspire, and I can't wait to see um, what happens in these next 20 days. So best of luck to all the candidates, and please um, make a voting plan, um, volunteer if you can, and donate if you can. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night.